Yeah, let's not waste any time. We'll get straight into episode two of Rings of Power and we'll see how it holds up to episode one. So we pick up right where we left off, with Galadriel stranded in the middle of the ocean with only a dagger and a long ceremonial dress, and of course, she is hundreds of miles from shore. She starts swimming, which I guess is her only option short of dying, but something tells me that she is aware that she won't actually have to swim the whole way. We then cut to the other cliffhanger from episode one, which is Nori discovering the man who fell from the sky in a fireball. Because Nori is brave, she seems unafraid of this unprecedented celestial phenomenon. Because Nori is clumsy, she falls down into the crater by accident. She then realizes that the fire surrounding the man is not in fact hot, which she must have known before falling into the crater, but I don't know why I'm expecting consistency from this show at this point. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Also, episode one established that fire doesn't give off heat when the location is evil. My hand is past feeling. This place is so evil, our torches give off no warmth. If this man turns out to be evil, then I will actually praise the writers for setting something up and then paying it off. When this man turns out to, in fact, not to be evil, then I will laugh, sigh, and cry myself to sleep. Poppy, Nori's friend, then tells herself and the audience that Nori is making that face, despite the fact that Poppy is standing behind Nori and thus cannot see her face, and despite the fact that we as the audience can clearly see Nori's face. Pretty pathetic, huh? This means that the writers have accomplished something of a double whammy in the opening minutes of episode two. They decided to add an ADR line emphasizing that Nori has a particular look on her face that worries Poppy, when the context of the line does not make sense in universe and when the information was already being conveyed to the audience. Try saying wasting your time via incompetence three times really fast. Because Nori is brave and curious, she approaches the seemingly unconscious man and investigates him. Then this happens. Okay, so this fella is a wizard of some kind. As I said in part one, I have not read the books, so I don't know, nor do I particularly care, whether or not this lines up with Tolkien's original timeline. Either this guy is Gandalf, Saruman, Radagast, one of the blue wizards, or some unnamed original character that the writers have invented. Or, I guess, he isn't actually a wizard, but I would be very surprised if this turns out to be the case. I wonder if we will ever learn his name. Nori then says that they can't leave him like this or the wolves will get him. So two things. Firstly, a wolf is not going any fucking where near this. Wolves don't typically like things that are on fire. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Secondly, what this guy just did should have blown your goddamn mind and terrified you. If he is capable of doing this, even accidentally, he is not going to be eaten by a wolf. But on second thought, actually, Nori is brave, which means nothing scares her. Character traits are actually quite simple, you see. Poppy then tells Nori that she is brave and that she doesn't follow the rules. Brace yourselves, guys, we still aren't done with that. Why me? Why me? I can't leave him like this or the wolves will get him. So? So that's not who we are. That's not who you are. So we can add to Nori's list of character traits that she is brave and clumsy and curious and brave and doesn't follow live the rule. We then see Sadok, the village elder, hypothesizing about what the meteor was. The Harfoots debate packing up camp and leaving, but end up deciding not to because they have a festival happening soon. Seems like a good enough reason, I guess. He then concludes, This does not bode well. We then see Nori and Poppy stealing materials from the camp, and Sadok doesn't seem to notice them. These two have not exactly been established to be stealthy or agile, and yet they are able to evade him entirely. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. We then see that the two Harfoots have managed to put the man in a wheelbarrow, and they debate whether or not he is a troll, a human, or an elf, and they conclude that they have no idea as no species that they are aware of falls from the sky. Nori indicates that they only have to hide the man for one night, which is an odd thing to say because they still don't know who or what he is. He's ludicrous, he's never gonna fit in that old car. It's just for one night. And they have zero understanding of what he wants or what he may do. As far as they can possibly know, he may well be asleep for thousands of years. But don't worry, you've only gotta take care of him for one night, I, I guess. 
We also learn that Nori is caring and has compassion for all creatures, which we did actually see a bit of in episode 1, but I guess I was distracted by her other three character traits being reinforced with almost every line of dialogue. Hence, she feels obligated to personally look after this man, even though she doesn't actually need to. And then, oh no, he starts wheelbarrowing down the hill. What unfortunate luck. The way this is filmed and the accompanying dialogue is clearly supposed to be funny rather than dramatic, and the fact that there are no consequences whatsoever to this gag suggests that the writers simply wanted a funny, so then they made the funny happen, and then they cut to the next scene where everything is okay again. Pretty pathetic, huh? Here's the thing, I don't believe that two Harfoots can stop a wheelbarrow with a human in from careening down a hill and smashing into something. Period. Let alone do it quietly, as we are led to believe is their intention. So Nori is stealthy in spite of also being clumsy. She is caring, compassionate, and brave. So anyway, they managed to get the man to a little hut, which I have to assume they didn't just build for this purpose, meaning it must be a part of the Harfoot's mobile village. I'll be charitable and assume that it is on the outskirts and not surrounded by the other huts, but even then, this does not seem like a good way to keep this man hidden. Poppy then asks Nori, Why are you doing this, Nori? Why? Because she is smart, brave, curious, kind, and caring. Did you not watch the last episode? Okay, I'll try to take this seriously. Nori concludes that she has a particular and specific responsibility to this man because he also conveniently fell from the sky directly next to her. It's like there's a reason this happened. Like, I was supposed to find him. Me. She believes that she and only she was supposed to find him. It seems rather like Nori is aware that she is a protagonist in a TV show. However, this does seem in keeping with Nori's character, and it also seems to be in keeping with the established superstitious beliefs of the Harfoots. Anyway, we then cut to Horden, the ruins of the village that used to be Bronwyn's hometown. Bronwyn and Arendir have travelled here to investigate the black goo that came from the cow. Bronwyn continues to display no emotional connection to her friends and kin that used to live here and have now either been abducted or have fled. Seriously, she knows this village so well that she knows the names of the couple whose house they have just entered, but she simply seems to recite this information to the audience as it would be of no help to Arendir whatsoever. This means that the writers wanted, for some reason, to further reinforce that Bronwyn has a connection to Horden, but their delivery method also reinforces that Bronwyn doesn't much care about Horden. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, they find a hole, and Arendir observes that someone must have dug it as it does not appear natural. Bronwyn, the medic who is maybe in her mid-twenties, corrects Arendir, the soldier who is potentially over a thousand years old, and states that men could not have dug it and it must have been something and not someone. Seems to me like the writers are trying to emphasize that she is not simply along for the ride and that she has her own agency and experience to bring to the table, even though she should be about as experienced as a five-year-old relative to Arendir, the immortal and ageless soldier. This is a bit odd as Arendir has already displayed incredible cognitive ability, and as an elf he quite simply has to be smarter than Bronwyn. But I guess the script has to let the girls have their moments, so I'll continue. Arendir decides to travel down the passage, and his reason is that he doesn't know where it leads. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. More importantly, he tells Bronwyn to return to Tir Harad and warn them. This seems a little irresponsible given that Horden has very recently been burned to the ground, and Bronwyn is expected to travel out of Horden and back to Tir Harad entirely on her own. Arendir seems to think that going down this hole is of greater importance than both protecting Bronwyn and warning Tirharad of a potentially impending attack. I'm sure nothing bad will happen as a result of this. Prioritizes exploring a hole over protecting Bronwyn. Knows all about holes. We then travel to Eregion, the realm of the Elven Smiths. Elrond tells Celebrimbor that the Hammer of Feanor that appears to currently belong to Celebrimbor was used to create the Silmarils, which contain the very light of Valinor. Of course, he is actually telling us, because Celebrimbor already knows this. Celebrimbor then tells Elrond and us that it is said that after Morgoth stole the Silmarils, he was so entranced that all he could do for weeks afterwards is stare at them, and that this only stopped when he shed a tear on one and was then faced with his own evil reflection. Pretty pathetic, huh? 
Not entirely sure how anyone could know this, unless Morgoth was the kind of guy to tell his enemies that he cries himself to sleep. I guess Morgoth was in fact a cuck after all. Anyway, we then learn that Celebrimbor is somewhat jealous of Feanor, and that he aspires for his own work to be acknowledged on the same level. This is interesting, as in episode one, we are told that Celebrimbor is... The greatest of elven smiths, of course. Suggesting that he is in fact better than Feanor already, so either the writers forgot, or they are setting up that Celebrimbor is in fact exceedingly modest and humble about his own achievements. Time will tell which one of these statements is true. We also learn that Celebrimbor desires to bring beauty to the world, and he plans to create a turbo forge that surpasses any currently existing forge, and can be used to create things that will change Middle-earth. He says it must be completed by spring, and that this was the reason why Gilgalad sent Elrond to work with Celebrimbor. Elrond then suggests enlisting the help of the dwarves in constructing this forge. So we don't yet know why it is vital that this forge be completed by spring, so I can't yet comment on whether or not this makes sense. Elrond being sent in place of the greatest workforce ever assembled also seems very strange as Elrond's skills do not seem to be in smithing, and even if they were, he is merely one person. This means that Elrond facilitating the help of the dwarves is either a gigantic cosmic coincidence, or this was Gilgalad's plan all along, in that he specifically sent Elrond to help Celebrimbor knowing of his ties to the dwarves. Again, which it is, I cannot say yet, but I am sure we will learn soon enough. We then travel to Khazad-dûm, and Celebrimbor tells Elrond that an alliance between elves and dwarves would be the diplomatic achievement of the age. This kinda suggests that Gilgalad sending Elrond to do something absurdly difficult in order to help Celebrimbor do something absurdly difficult seems absurd. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. However, Elrond tells us that Prince Durin is an old and dear friend and is like a brother to him. It is possible that Gilgalad knew about this, but my guess at this point is that it is a contrivance rather than a deliberate ploy by the High King. Anyway, we can observe that Elrond and Celebrimbor have walked from Eregion to khazad -dûm. Their clothes have not changed, they do not appear to have any horses or any supplies such as food or water. From looking at a map of Middle-earth, you can see that Eregion is approximately the same distance from khazad as Hobbiton is from Bree. The journey from Hobbiton to Bree was around 120 miles and took around 40 hours. So these two just walked for over 100 miles with no supplies. Alrighty then. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. It also seems odd that they travelled for days without Elrond telling Celebrimbor why they are going to khazad only to then have this conversation moments before arriving. Almost like they teleported here. Anyway, Celebrimbor tells us that he admires the dwarves for their skilled craftsmanship, and he gives us the first line in the show that I actually really like. I admire all who can see into the mystery of things, who can divine from the plainness of what is, the beauty of what could be. Very good, Kronk! So, Elrond is well versed in history, and Celebrimbor is modest, aspirational, dislikes war, wants to make the world a better place, and has a deep admiration for the dwarves. Anyway, Elrond then says that Prince Durin will greet them with open arms and he will give them salted pork and malt beer because it was like the th in it was the thing in the other He then tells the guard that they seek an audience with the prince and their request is denied. <coughs> Elrond reiterates that he is friends with Prince Durin and yet the response is still the same indicating that Durin has specifically denied entry to Elrond. Elrond pauses for a moment and then invokes the right of Sigin Tarag and is allowed inside. This statue here wobbles a bit, because I guess that's the kind of dwarven craftsmanship a billion dollary dudes gets ya. And Elrond indicates that he needs a few days to get Durin on side to help Celebrimbor. Then Elrond is escorted inside, and Celebrimbor is abandoned outside of the mountain. So, to be absolutely clear, Elrond just abandoned Celebrimbor a hundred plus miles from anywhere. He has no horses, no food, no change of clothes, no water, and no further means of communicating with Elrond. What? What does that have to do with him? No, no. He's got a point. I know the writers accidentally established that Celebrimbor actually has no need for any of those things, because how else did they get here? But this is still absolutely a dick move from Elrond. Celebrimbor will have walked to khazad and then walked back, for entirely no reason, because Elrond misjudged his relationship with Prince Durin. This is made even worse, because the previous scene made clear that Celebrimbor has a deep admiration for the dwarves, has always wanted to see them at work, and was told he may even be allowed into their workshop. And now he's kind of in the woods, 
and has to walk home, which is over a hundred miles away, because Elrond is a dick. So Elrond is very confident in his diplomatic skills and is a dick. We then follow Elrond through khazad Doom. khazad Doom looks pretty damn cool. The guards, on the other hand, look and walk like they are children playing dress-up, which they may in fact be. Prince Durin then approaches Elrond. Durin explains to the other dwarves and us as the audience what the right of Sigin Tarag is. It sure is a good thing that the characters of Middle-earth like to tell each other things that they already know. What a convenient writing tool. This means that the writers are able to communicate this information to the audience without it feeling clunky and lazy. Anyway, the right of Sigin Tarag means that Elrond has challenged Prince Durin to a rock-smashing competition. If he loses, he is banished forever from all dwarven land. Even though he seemingly already was, meaning he literally has nothing to lose. Oh, yeah. It's all coming together. If Elrond wins, he shall be granted a single boon, which is presumed to be an audience with Prince Durin. So, a few comments. It is extremely convenient that such a right even exists, as it gives Elrond the ability to enter Khazad Doom. Of course, if the writers simply wanted Elrond to enter Khazad Doom, they could have made the guards at the door say yes instead of no. But as we will see, they want to have their cake and eat it too. They want there to be drama between Elrond and Durin, but they also need a way of getting Elrond inside to be able to speak to Durin. Secondly, I'm not entirely convinced that Elrond, who doesn't appear to be a warrior, nor does he seem to be physically capable in Rings of Power, could ever hope to defeat Durin in a rock-smashing contest, which is precisely what dwarves are good at. As we will find out soon, though, that won't actually matter either. <coughs> okay, Elrond is somewhat confident in his physical ability, and Durin is brash, loud, confident, and believable as a leader. We then come back to Nori, who has returned with food for the man she has decided to babysit. The man has just woken up and is scribbling on a rock. I'm not entirely sure where Poppy is, but I guess she just kind of left him on his own. The man seems to be unable to speak at all and is extremely easily startled. He lets out a very loud yell and causes the sky to go dark, which you would think would be noticed by someone, maybe by certain characters that are very superstitious and have already taken particular interest in the strangeness of the sky. But remember, if they are off screen, they don't exist. Nori manages to calm him down because of course she is brave and caring and she seems to be able to communicate with him via sign language due to his apparent inability to speak. I'm not quite sure how he understands that pulling on your ear means deal, but whatever, let's move on. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. She theorizes that the man can't remember his own name and she then teaches him how to eat. What we are then treated to is by far the funniest scene in Rings of Power so far. We see the Harfords in the village are arguing about who should be helping with what for this festival that they are planning, and they realize that Nori is not present when she was specifically meant to be helping with one job in particular. Nori's dad ends up doing the job without her, and because she was not present, the rope snaps, his foot snaps, and he falls over. Firstly, I'll deal with the superficial. Given the direction that he was pushing, it is not possible for his ankle to break in this way. It shoots over to the right when there was no force being applied in that direction. Pretty pathetic, huh? Now for the hilarious bit. The writers wanted to show us explicitly that Nori is causing problems by prioritizing looking after the strange man. And the way they decided to do this would be to have everything go as catastrophically wrong as possible because Nori happened to not be there to help. This is utterly juvenile writing. Poppy then brings Nori to her father and Nori takes the lesson that the writers so bluntly wanted her to take from this scenario. Here's the problem. If I plan to build a house with my friend, and my friend doesn't show up, so then I try to do it on my own, and I break my leg as a result, that is entirely my fault. Nori is not responsible for what happened to her father. Because, however, we have been told that Nori feels responsible for everyone, this isn't actually out of character for her, it just doesn't make sense, really. To further reinforce that Nori feels bad for the thing that wasn't her fault, Sadok then asks her if her father can actually walk anymore, which I guess makes him a socially challenged dick too. Feels responsible for everyone and is caring. Now we get to the scene I have been excitedly waiting for since the end of episode one. We are about to learn what happened to Galadriel after she threw herself into the middle of the ocean. 
The cinematography here emphasizes that Galadriel is quite clearly in the middle of nowhere. She should be utterly screwed. But wait, what's that in the distance? Could it be, yes, a Deus Ex life raft? Has she just accidentally her way out of certain death for the second time? It certainly appears so. Why me? Why me? All I will say here is that the odds of a boat and a person accidentally crossing paths hundreds of miles from the shore are so astronomically low as to be practically an impossibility. On this raft, there are five extras and this guy, who let's just say is acting... distinctly. The tides of fate are flowing. Well, if no one else will. Yours may be heading in. Or out. <laughs> They offer her water, which unfortunately confirms that yes, Galadriel does in fact require water to survive, thus making her die from the ship that much more retarded. They decide to allow her aboard and demand answers from her. I was separated from my ship. Yeah, you keep, you keep telling yourself that. It sounds a little less spastic than I leapt from my ship and into the middle of the goddamn ocean. The extras then explain that they were attacked by a worm, hence them being on a ruined raft. They begin to explain what happened specifically, and then this dude, who is totally not going to be a recurring character, says this. Does she look dangerous to you? Looks can be deceiving. But appearances... can be deceptive. Yeah. Duh, I wonder if this man is hiding something. Duh. They then realize Galadriel is an elf, and in response, Galadriel, um... acts? Remove your hand from me, sir. She is then accused of being a liar, even though she didn't lie, nor do these extras have any reason to believe that she is lying. However, before this conflict can be resolved, they accidentally themselves across another boat. Holy contrivance, Batman. Although, as we will learn seconds later, this is not in fact a boat, but the worm that destroyed their ship. Whilst this means that this is not in fact a contrivance that they just so happen to come across yet another ship in the middle of the ocean, it does instead mean that this worm is hunting them for reasons. Gotta get rid of those extras some ways, am I right? Anyway, this worm is goddamn gigantic, and yet it is able to sneak up on all seven of them after they knew it was there, including Galadriel, who has basically been depicted as a god until this point. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Anyway, the extras die, and because of convenient conveniences, the only two survivors are Galadriel and Subtle McGee, whose name we learn is Halbrand. Interestingly, he asks Galadriel what their heading is, which seems odd, but I guess we'll see where that goes. Okay, Galadriel can be snuck up on by a giant sea monster, and Halbrand is totally not evil. We then return to the SMASHING contest, and Elrond predictably loses. More specifically though, he resigns after his first failure to smash a rock. Prince Durin dumps another nonsensical metaphor on us, which seems to be a recurring theme for this show. A dog may bark at the moon, but he cannot bring it down. But what does that have to do with him? No, no. He's got a point. And he orders Elrond to leave as per the rules of the right of the plot contrivance. Elrond asks Prince Durin to escort him to the exit, and he accepts. The two of them travel through Khazad Doom. Curiously, Prince Durin has no form of royal escort or guards to speak of, so I guess it's a good thing that Elrond wasn't there to assassinate him. We then get some terrible visual effects, and again, I really hate to compare- who am I kidding, I fucking love doing this- the way the Peter Jackson movies used a variety of visual effects to convince us that the different races of Middle-earth are all of varying sizes is, in a word, fantastic, and in another word, genius. And due to the fact that they used every trick in the book, the effects still hold up to this day. In this scene here, with Durin and Elrond on the elevator, they appear to simply have filmed each actor on a green screen, and then resized Durin to make him smaller. I am by no means an expert on visual effects though, so I could of course be wrong, but so far, to my eyes, this is the worst shot of the show in terms of visual fidelity. Now to the actual content of the scene. Elrond indicates that the city has changed since he last visited, which suggests that much of the architectural splendor of Khazad Doom was constructed within the last 20 years. Durin tells us that he has been very offended by Elrond, as Elrond has not visited him in the last 20 years, despite them previously considering each other to be friends. Elrond doesn't have much luck with those he calls friend, does he? Elrond says that before he leaves, he thinks it is in Durin's best interest to at least listen to his proposal, which further irritates Durin, as Elrond has just revealed that his reason for finally visiting his friend after 20 years is that he wants something. This is a rather counterproductive card to play, and not one we would expect from a character who is established to be confident in his diplomatic abilities. I want to hear about you. Why, Elrond? 
You really have become a politician. You make it sound so grim. An alliance with the dwarves would be the diplomatic achievement of the age. Their prince is an old and dear friend, almost like a brother to me. He'll welcome us with open arms. Durin further reveals that Elrond missed both his wedding and the birth of his two children. You missed my wedding! The birth of my children, two of them! You cannot barge into my mountain and demand I welcome you with open arms! You cannot claim that which you discarded! discarded. Context aside, I do quite like the character, or at least the actor, playing Durin. He is giving what is definitely the best performance of the series so far. They also play with the idea that 20 years may be the blink of an eye to an elf, as elves are immortal, but unless Elrond genuinely doesn't care about Durin, I find it very hard to believe that his understanding of time is that terrible. Elrond then apologizes and wishes to also apologize to Elrond's family. Wait, 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 are they about to? So then Durin agrees and allows Elrond to visit his home in order to apologize to his wife, Deesa. Wait, are they seriously? And Durin makes clear that Elrond is to apologize and then leave and he is explicitly not to stay for dinner. Yeah, they're actually doing this. They are going to resolve this seemingly deep character conflict for Durin, and also disregard the consequences of the right of plot contrivance in this one single scene. Pretty pathetic, huh? We then meet Deesa, who has evidently heard all about Elrond, indicating that maybe Durin isn't particularly good at holding grudges. Deesa then insists that Elrond stays for dinner. Who saw that coming? And from this point on, the legitimate upset and depth we were able to glean from Durin in the scene on the lift is reduced to almost a comedic yeah, well, I still don't really like you vibe where all is forgiven. We then learn how Durin and Deesa met each other, which I guess is enough to make us forget that two minutes earlier, Durin had serious and justified feelings of betrayal due to Elrond's apparent lack of concern for him. Throughout their conversation, Elrond and Durin continue to take jabs at each other, but this is put to rest by Deesa. We then learn something which definitely causes some problems. We learn that Elrond, if we assume he is not outright lying to Durin, was not sent to ask the dwarves for aid on behalf of High King Gil-galad. Coming to Khazad Doom was apparently entirely his own idea. This means that either it is a coincidence that Gilgalad happened to pick the one guy who could forge an alliance between the elves and the dwarves, or, and I think this is more likely, Elrond is something of a useful idiot being manipulated by Gilgalad because Gilgalad knew of Elrond's friendly connection to Prince Durin. Either way, we have a plot contrivance or a serious character flaw, so take your pick. We then learn that at some point in the past, Elrond gave Durin a sapling as a gift. In the 20 years that they have not seen each other, Durin planted it and tended to it like it was his own child. Apparently, some dwarves called Durin a fool for believing it would grow in such darkness. Even though the tree is not in darkness, it's quite clearly in direct sunlight. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. And Elrond seems to suggest that sunlight is not the reason why it grew. Love is, in fact, the reason why it grew. But... What does that have to do with him? No, no. He's got a point. This is yet another example of the writers thinking of a cool-sounding metaphor, but then somewhere along the production, some wires got crossed and they forgot that the tree was actually supposed to be in darkness. What we have now as a result is a tree that grew due to sunlight and a metaphor that falls flat on its face. Elrond then attempts to leave, which makes Deesa feel bad, which in turn makes Durin feel bad, and thus Elrond is able to stay and offer Durin his proposal. Okay, so Durin is caring and forgiving, and Elrond is potentially manipulable and ignorant if he is being manipulated by Gilgalad. He is terrible at timekeeping and bad at reading social cues. Cut to Galadriel and Halbrand. Galadriel questions why Halbrand abandoned his companions so readily. Did you not see the goddamn sea worm woman? Anyway, Halbrand's decision to abandon the raft before it is eaten by the worm is the only reason why Galadriel is still alive at this point. Had he not done this, she would at best be adrift in the middle of the ocean, or at worst, she would be inside the sea worm. Halbrand accuses Galadriel of being a deserter, and Galadriel retorts, Do I look like a deserter? I'm conflicted on what to criticize here. On the one hand, Galadriel does not look like a soldier whatsoever, so I don't know why Halbrand would assume that she is one. On the other hand, there is no real logical reason why she would be out here on her own. But I guess logic isn't something I should really consider here. Halbrand intuits that Galadriel is running either from or to something, and she replies that she has a duty to return to Middle-earth. Then this happens. Important health business, no doubt. What have elves ever done to you? Do you blame us for your being stranded here? 
I do not have the first idea why Galadriel is being so aggressive here, because whilst Halbrand is very clearly hiding something, he has not indicated any bias against elves. So whilst Halbrand is clearly a bit of a sketchy dick, Galadriel is, I guess, imagining that he doesn't like elves? Halbrand reveals that the way he sees it, elves didn't chase him from his homeland, orcs did. That he says, the way I see it, suggests that there could maybe be some ambiguity here, but if orcs chased him from his homeland, then where is the ambiguity? My guess is we will never know. This then prompts Galadriel to remember the magic E. Presumably she is wondering if there were any magic E's in Halbrand's village. Halbrand doesn't clarify where he is from, but he does say that it is now ashes. Galadriel then says that she knows something of the pain he carries as her home is decidedly not ashes, which makes anti-sense. Galadriel asks in a roundabout way what kingdom Halbrand is from because she believes that she may be able to reclaim it before she knows what kingdom it is or where it is. I told you, there's nothing this gal can't do. She seems to brush off the idea of not having an army, saying, leave the army to me, even though episode one showed us that she is unable to even get another squad of groupies to help her take down Sauron, let alone a goddamn army. She then gives Halbrand a stern talking down to, which has become characteristic of this appalling character. Because rather than rest in glory, I chose to seek out the very enemy responsible for your suffering. I am so righteous and noble that I decided to turn down eternal glory and peace in order to defeat the enemy that drove you from your homeland, you silly, silly man. Jesus Christ, just throw this woman overboard already. Halbrand informs Galadriel that no matter how proud she is, she can't fix his suffering. And Galadriel then says, I have pursued this foe since before the first sunrise bloodied the sky. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. This is horse shit, unless we are expected to believe that the sun didn't rise once in the hundreds of years between you being born and you taking on your brother's vow after the defeat of Morgoth, you utter titbean. She then says that it would take longer than Halbrand's lifetime to speak the names of those they have taken from her. Do you know what autistic is? So Halbrand looks to be maybe 35, which is 1 billion 104 million seconds. If it takes a generous 5 seconds to say each name, that means Galadriel claims to have lost approximately 220 million friends. Let's do it now, actually. This video is already going to be a long boy, so let's start the timer. People Galadriel has lost. 3, 2, 1, go. Finrod. Um... Halbrand observes that Galadriel has let slip her true motivation for wanting to return to Middle-earth, which is to kill orcs as an act of revenge rather than for any heroic or selfless reasons. It is rather refreshing to see someone push back on her utter self-entitled bullshit, isn't it? Anyway, this pisses off Galadriel as I guess she is still just as emotionally fragile and violent as she was hundreds of years ago when those kids broke her origami boat, and then Halbrand informs her that he is from the Southlands. Oh dear, rings of power. I hope you aren't doing what I think you're doing. Bear with me here. Halbrand claims to be from the Southlands. Halbrand's village was burned down. We know that Arendir and Bronwyn have just arrived at Horden, which was burned down. This is potentially implying that Halbrand is from Horden. If you recall during episode one, we see the meteor passing all of the different locations of Middle-earth, confirming that these stories are all taking place at the same time. This means that if, as implied, Halbrand is from Horden, he was able to get from Horden all the way across Middle-earth onto a boat and into the middle of the ocean in the time it took Arendir and Bronwyn to walk from Tirharad to Horden. I hope that they don't reveal that Halbrand was in fact from Horden, but I guess... There never was much hope. Just a fool's hope. Galadriel then orders Halbrand to take her to the Orc's last known location before acquiring an army, I guess, and Halbrand refuses. This is good, because Halbrand has zero reason to do what Galadriel says, although it does make me question why he asked her, what's our heading, earlier in the episode. In one final act of feminism, Galadriel tells Halbrand sarcastically to prepare yourself, because there is a storm on the horizon, because being utterly insufferable to the man who just saved your life is an endearing character trait, I guess. So Galadriel is apparently sympathetic towards others' losses is very defensive of elves and is sarcastic. And Halbrand is perceptive and intuitive, doesn't take bullshit, doesn't mince words, and his village was burned down by orcs. 
Cut to Bronwyn running back to Tirharad. I guess she made it out safely, thank god. She informs the people in the pub that Horden is empty and that there are no bodies. The people of Horden seem to believe that they fell in the hole rather than that whatever burned the village down took them. It was as if the grounds had swallowed up the people of Horden like flies. Round is tit, she always has been. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. The barman, who seems to be in charge of the village, says that without proof, he doesn't want Bronwyn scaring people by causing a fuss. I guess her detailed descriptions weren't enough, but okay, this one can slide. Then Bronwyn's son, Theo, destroys the floor because he can hear mice. This seems like a slight overreaction, but don't worry, we'll get a jump scare so that way we don't have time to think about the fact that this kid seemingly loses all control of his emotions because there are mice. Pretty pathetic, huh? We then join Arendir in the tunnel underneath Horden, and we see claw marks. There certainly is a spooky afoot, oh dear. If only Arendir hadn't put himself in a tunnel with a monster. I guess he isn't that smart after all. Do you know what autistic is? He is then ambushed by a group of whatever these things are, which one would think wouldn't be possible given that elves supposedly have extremely acute hearing. Okay, Arendir acts without thinking. Apparently does not have heightened senses. We then see that Theo was able to hide in a cupboard and was not discovered by whatever the monster in the floor was, even though going by these claw marks it came up and had a good look around for him. Bronwyn arrives and Theo tells her to go and get help while he stays in the cupboard. Bronwyn then abandons her son for the second time- oh no, wait, she actually decides to stay in a different cupboard, thereby putting herself in danger for no reason whatsoever in order to pretend like she's looking after her son. Just grab him and leave, you spurg. Then the spooky emerges from the tunnel under the floor, sneaks around for a bit, discovers Bronwyn, and then Theo is able to climb out of his cupboard, cross the room on the creaky floorboards, and stab the spooky in the back without it noticing, all in the space of about a second. This, good people, is the magic of editing. You can hide so much. This creature demonstrates that it is strong enough to be able to punch through a solid wooden table and is then able to throw the table across the room like it's made of paper. This is some Captain America level super strength right here, so whatever this thing is, it is pretty goddamn strong. Unfortunately for this creature, being incredibly strong doesn't help you if you have terrible hearing and spatial awareness, even though this creature has been established to have pretty damn good hearing and spatial awareness. Because Bronwyn yells and charges at it for a good couple of seconds before stabbing it in the back. In what I can only describe as the mother of all conveniences, the sword gets stuck on a thingy, which means that the creature is stuck and can't move, giving Theo the chance to tie a noose and hook it. I was very much expecting this to go somewhere, where they keep it alive to show the town that the threat is real, hence the apparent need for the contrivance. But no. Theo fails to hang the creature, which means that Bronwyn then decapitates it with one swing of her sword. She then takes the severed head to the pub and tells the good people of Tirharad, Come with me if you want to live. Now, if I was a sexism, I would observe at this point that all the men in this show are big dum-dums and all the women know what's really going on, but as I'm not a sexism, I will simply say yeah, you go girl. Okay, Bronwyn is extremely physically strong and is brave. Cut to Galadriel and Halbrand dealing with the thunderstorm. This scene really stretches believability because they are on what amounts to a plank of wood. There was really no need for the riders to make the storm anywhere near this ridiculous, but it was a rather blunt way for them to accomplish a few things. Galadriel is thrown overboard and is saved by Halbrand. When I say saved, I mean he puts her back on the plank of wood during a tsunami. Hopefully they make it out of this alive. On second thought, Halbrand has already saved Galadriel's life by picking her up after the worm encounter, which means this storm and this scene are entirely unnecessary. Cut to- yeah, I guess they do make it out alive, because remember kids, if it isn't on screen, it isn't happening. One day modern writers will learn about object permanence. Where was I? Oh yeah, cut to the Harfoots. We see the Meteor Man walking around on his own before he is found by Nori and Poppy. Nori apologizes to him and she says she is sorry that she can't help him, as the Harfoots are about to migrate and she presumably has to make sure her dad doesn't shatter every joint in his body. The man appears to freak out because of their lanterns and he then speaks to the fireflies that were within the lanterns. This is further reinforcing this idea that the man is Gandalf, as they are making very deliberate callbacks to imagery used in the Peter Jackson trilogy. I'm not going to talk about this now, but if I ever finish this series, I will collect the various examples of Rings of Power explicitly referencing the Peter Jackson trilogy to milk that sweet, sweet nostalgia boner, all while claiming to be doing their own thing. Anyway, we now see that the Fireflies have died. Presumably they were killed by this man, although we do not yet know why. Hmm. 
don't know, don't care. How's that? And we then return to Casa Doom and we see Durin speaking with his father, the king. Durin assures his father that Elrond doesn't know. And the king asks Durin if he thinks it's a coincidence that the elves suddenly need help from the dwarves. Durin replies that he trusts Elrond, even though for nearly half the time he has known Elrond, he has been entirely absent from his life. The king suggests that Elrond is asking the dwarves for their help because he knows about some secret discovery they have recently made. The king then shows Durin something glowing in a box, which I assume is whatever this super secret thing is. Of course, the only reason why the king walked over to the box, opened it, and looked at what was inside was to provide a visual cliffhanger for those members of the audience who periodically leave the room to lick some windows. We then see that Galadriel and Halbrand did in fact survive the storm at sea. Both appear to be barely conscious, suggesting that this boat has just randomly found them. And that, dear viewer, marks the end of episode two of Rings of Power. Now then, let's take a look at each plot thread and see what the writers wanted to accomplish and the various ways in which the writers manipulated time and space in order to facilitate their plot needs. We can start with Galadriel's plot. The writers needed to have her escape the consequences of her actions at the end of the previous episode, and they needed to introduce the character of Halbrand. They needed to establish that Halbrand is, put simply, sketchy as fuck. They needed to establish that Halbrand looks out seemingly entirely for himself, although he is also willing to help Galadriel despite her being... Well, despite her being the character she is established to be. The writers used the character of Halbrand to allow Galadriel to inform us that she felt duty-bound to return to Middle-earth, which we already knew. And the writers used the character of Galadriel to inform us that Halbrand sees through her egotistical bullshit, which is actually quite refreshing. I hope this guy doesn't turn out to be evil. Anyway, the way the writers saved Galadriel in episode 2 amounts to essentially writing, and then this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened, instead of the more narratively coherent and satisfying, this happened because of this, but then this happened as a result of that, etc, etc. We can take these beats, which are basically the beats of your outline, and if the words and then belong between those beats, you're f Galadriel accidentally finds a raft with some survivors on board. Those survivors are quickly and conveniently removed from the plot, with the exception of Halbrand, who then assists Galadriel for reasons that are unclear, but I assume they will be expanded upon later. Halbrand explicitly saves Galadriel's life twice, and then the two of them accidentally get found by another ship. And finally, Halbrand tells Galadriel about where he came from, and that it was attacked by orcs, thereby giving Galadriel a short-term goal and motivation. Again, I assume that there is far more to Halbrand than meets the eye, because he is, as the kids say, sus, which could potentially call everything he says and does into question. Until the show tells me more about Halbrand, I will reserve judgment on how well written of a character he is. Galadriel's plot in episode 2 as a whole, however, is contrivance followed by contrivance followed by contrivance. Now on to the Arendir and Bronwyn plot. The writers needed these two to explore Horden, have Arendir get captured, and have Bronwyn evacuate Tyr Harad. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, the way they accomplish this begins with them further reinforcing that Bronwyn knows the people of Horden very well, which emphasizes the fact that she is quite possibly a psychopath, given her lack of emotional response to the situation she is in. She is pretty much on par with Arendir in this department, but with Arendir it makes sense. Arendir is at least hundreds, potentially thousands, of years old, and he is a soldier. He is acting largely how one would expect. Bronwyn is not. Anyway, in order to be captured, Arendir decides to explore the mysterious hole in the ground in the abandoned and destroyed village. His only reason for going down there is that he does not know what is down there, which when you think about it is actually a reason not to go down there. Do you know what autistic is? Anyway, the writers know that they want Arendir to be captured in this episode, so I guess down he goes. It's just easier to have him be a dumbass momentarily than to have him be captured due to being outsmarted or overconfident or anything that tells us anything about his character. While Arendir is spelunking, Bronwyn needs to convince the people of Horden to evacuate. Rather than having them accept that maybe there is some truth to her story, the barman's response to Bronwyn's claim that the city is deserted and destroyed, and there is a giant unnatural hole in the ground, is, yeah, well, the ground is kind of dodged sometimes, I don't know. So regardless, Bronwyn needs to find a way to prove to the people of Tirharad that she is telling the truth. Right on time, the evil spooky that was digging holes has just digged a diggy hole right under Bronwyn's house, of all places. So not only did this creature arrive just in time for her to be proven right, but it also decided to dig its way right under her house. Now, the more astute viewer might be thinking, but hold on, doesn't her son have the evil sword with the mark of Sauron on it? And you are absolutely correct. Given what we have been told by Galadriel, even though she pulled this information out of thin air, it would make sense for the orcs to head towards the evil sword, hence them digging specifically to Bronwyn's house. However, this would be the first and only example of the mark of Sauron being used in this way, and it is still incredibly convenient timing. 
And it doesn't explain what happened to Horden. Did Horden also have an evil sword? So whilst this plotline gets a plus for implying rather than outright stating that the Mark of Sauron caused the orcs to come to Tiharad, this is knocked more than a few pegs right back down again because of the other conveniences surrounding this fact. And to be honest, I don't even know that the evil sword is the reason the orcs came here. Maybe I'm just willing to give the writers more credit than they deserve. Anyway, Bronwyn and Theo defeat the spooky diggy boy in a scene which is, simply put, absurd nonsense that makes the monster appear super powerful but also… retarded. Let's go through this point by point and see what we can learn about this creature. It clearly has very good hearing because it is able to find Bronwyn in the cupboard. It also clearly does not have very good hearing because Theo is able to sneak up on it and stab it in the back. And later in the scene, Bronwyn yells at it and is still able to charge it and stab it in the back again. It is clearly extremely physically strong because it both punches clean through a table and throws the table across the room with seemingly little effort. It is also notably unintelligent as it is pursuing Theo, presumably with intent to kill. When Theo runs up some stairs, the creature destroys the stairs instead of climbing them and killing him. As this is the first orc-type creature we have seen in Rings of Power so far, I don't yet know if this is actually a regular orc or a particular roided up dumbass orc that they use for digging. Which of these two ends up being correct will affect my overall view of this scene. Anyway, Bronwyn then drops off the orc's decapitated head at the pub because she's an uber macho, strong and silent kick-ass mum. And we later see that this was sufficient proof as presumably the entirety of Tir Harad is evacuating as a result of this. So overall the Arendir Bronwyn plot was pretty special. Arendir became an idiot and Bronwyn became an orc killing machine. So if I'm as charitable as possible and I assume that the insane contrivance of the orcs literally tunneling under her house was due to the evil sword, then I would rank this plot as middling when compared to the others. If the orcs arrival has nothing to do with the evil sword, then this plot line is the worst we have seen so far. Now on to Nori's plot, which primarily involves her interactions with the mystery man who fell from the sky. The writers needed to set up that he is something Nori and presumably Middle-earth at large have never experienced before. I think the only reasonable assumption is that he is a wizard, but I can't really say any more than that at this point. We learn that Nori feels responsible for the not-wizard for reasons that are not any more complex than saying that Nori feels responsible for everyone. She explicitly states at one point that this is not the case. Like it's my responsibility. You feel like everyone is your responsibility? No! This is different. But then later in the episode when her dad breaks his ankle, we learn that this does in fact seem to be the case. Nori gradually befriends the not wizard and teaches him to speak in a rudimentary fashion and also teaches him to eat. And we also get the aforementioned hilarious scene where the writers wanted to make clear that Nori is shirking her duties as a Harfoot by breaking the rules and spending time with this strange man by having her dad act like a grade A retarded person so that Nori can then feel guilty about not being there to stop him. And the conclusion of this plot for now is that Nori makes clear that she doesn't think that she can actually help the stranger who then appears to speak to the fireflies and makes them into a constellation so that Nori can presumably follow it somewhere and give her something to do in episode 3. So overall the Nori plot in episode 2 is definitely better than the Galadriel one because the sequence of events appears largely to adhere to the basic rules of causality, however the character work is, as usual, as blunt as a rock. And finally we get the Elrond plot. The Elrond plot needed to have Elrond acquire a workforce for Celebrimbor. The writers needed to establish who the dwarves are, who Durin is, and what Durin and Elrond's relationship is like. These characters needed to overcome their differences for the most part, and the episode ends somewhat ambiguously as the king never actually agrees to help Elrond despite Prince Durin vouching for him. This, subjectively, is my favourite part of Rings of Power thus far because I quite like the character of Durin. Objectively, however, when it comes to the writing, this subplot is verging on nonsense. We have the absurdity of Elrond and Celebrimbor walking to Casa Doom. We have the very much out of character decision for Elrond to abandon Celebrimbor, someone he deeply respects, in the wilderness hundreds of miles from his home. We have Elrond being denied entry to Casa Doom due to an appropriate and in character decision from Prince Durin, which is then subverted by the insane contrivance that there is a particular thingy you can just say, which means all dwarves have to kind of let you in anyway. We have Prince Durin telling a room full of people something they already know. We have the very understandable and again in character diatribe from Durin establishing his anger and frustration with Elrond, but this is neutered by Elrond's inexplicable lack of understanding as to what he has done wrong as well as Durin accidentally on purpose inviting Elrond to dinner. 
This is made even more ridiculous when Durin states that he believes the reason for Elrond finally visiting his supposed friend after 20 years is because he was sent by the Elven King to steal the dwarves' magical MacGuffin. This plot ends with Durin hearing Elrond's proposal, which as far as we can assume at this point involves the dwarves building Celebrimbor's forge for him in return for some kind of payment, and Durin's father the king making clear that he does not want elves and dwarves to work together. So in conclusion, the Elrond plot is a mess of contrivances and inexplicable character decisions that brings with it a complete lack of respect for distance and time. So that brings us to the end of episode 2 of Rings of Power. Before concluding, I have three questions which I will be watching closely for an answer to going ahead. Why did Gilgalad send Elrond specifically to help Celebrimbor? Why must the forge be completed by spring? And is Halbrand actually from Horden? Hopefully we will get some satisfactory answers to all of these, but my confidence in this show continues on its downward trajectory. Overall, I definitely enjoyed this episode more than episode 1, almost entirely because of the Khazad Doom scenes, but as I have explained, those scenes are no better mechanically than any of the other subplots. At this point, the show is pretty universal in its writing quality, which means there is little to no hope that the show will end up as anything approaching good by the end of the season. The best I can reasonably hope for is for it to be superficially enjoyable, which I at least got a hint of in this episode. Well, if you made it this far, thanks so much for watching. If you would like to see my coverage of episodes 3 through to the end of the season, please consider liking, sharing, or subscribing. If you have any thoughts, if you agree with me or disagree with me, or you think I missed something, please let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in my next video.